Hi, everyone. First of all, thank you, Julia, for being here. We're going to present two papers that you've been working on and summarize your findings quickly. And then we'll uh, talk about some limitations and points that we want to add relating to the papers and then take the discussion forward and have a debate about it. So the first paper that we looked at, I don't know if it's working. Uh, yeah, no, it's just slow, yeah. All right. Um, the first paper that we looked at is about providing decent living with uh, minimal energy, and it's a global scenario. So the aim of the paper is to estimate minimal final energy requirements for decent living standards to be provided to the entire global population in 2050. And the methods um, that was used was an energy model which proposed a list of basic material needs that underpin human well-being and consider final as opposed to primary energy. So final in the sense of electricity versus primary energy, which is going to be coal and other kind of primary resources. So the premises that this paper takes is, um, as I said in the presentation, that levels of energy use bol bolster the ecological crisis and that energy efficiency, and we'll come back to it later, has mostly served to boost productivity and lead to more economic growth in relation to the Jevons paradox. And that there is a drastic increase in energy use in the recent decades that past a certain threshold does not benefit well-being. So this is uh, the main findings that were in the paper. Um, I'll gloss over them because we already talked about some of them. But basically it's saying that if we have radical demand side transformi transformation of energy and efficient technologies, we could drastically reduce the energy requirements for everyone to have a good life. It could be even over 60% lower than consumption today according to this paper. Some limitations that we saw in the paper is that the results seem to vary greatly depending on the level of technology available and the energy demand of the population, which means that the energy requirements could look very different from one country to another country and within classes. There are also, as it's pointed out in the paper, no guarantees that these countries, even if they have the energy service required, will equitably distribute these energy services. And we'll come back to it later, but there are no links to the political context needed to create an atmosphere where we can have drastic change in energy requirements. We read another paper by uh, Professor Julia uh, on the large inequality, and the ambition of this paper was to use energy consumption, expenditure, and footprints data to estimate inequalities in the wealth distribution, and the method that she adopted was to use an input-output analysis between income group of individuals. This was done for 86 countries, and the analysis also calculates like inequalities across the sectors and energy consumption usage, and if you saw those bubble charts, this is uh, the paper. So uh, the best thing that I liked about the paper was the, some of the heterodox approaches that have been used. One was to move away from GDP as a yardstick to measure wealth inequality. Um, this, ex this, this is a very innovative way of using energy consumption expenditure footprints uh, to measure inequality. I will come to that later why. And then, of course, modeling is based on an input-output analysis. I don't need to explain Leontief and Serafa for that. And the most unique part or the original part of this was the sectoral and commodity-wise breakup of inequalities also gives a very crucial insight to policymakers to which inequalities should be addressed first, which unfortunately, like Professor told us, nobody is listening. Um, so yeah, so this is why I uh, find this very interesting because if you look at the comparison of inequalities, whether it's wealth, and if you look at the direct energy and indirect energy consumption inequalities that uh, Professor Sandberg mentioned in her paper, then you see that there is a limit to what humans can consume. There is a limit. Even if you include the conspicuous consumption, this is basically the share of the richest 10% uh, in the total energy produced in uh, uh, or across the globe. No, no, just keep it back there. So if you look at this, then you see that the uh, there is a limit to which uh, even the richest 10% can consume. So uh, if they are earning 60 to 80% of the global income, then it should worry us because they cannot consume more, more than like 40% of what the energy is produced. So there is a conversation on limit, which is coming from here. And the second part was this inequality international and intranational. So this is very clearly exhibiting that there is a very high degree of correlation 
between um, the inequality in uh, consumption expenditure and the footprints, right? That, that's this chart. And the other one was as the energy footprint increases, the expenditure per capita also increases. Like, so in higher capita per, uh, expenditure countries, you have higher um, energy footprint. So that's very interesting. Uh, yeah, and then she mentioned about this thing. So, so this was the part I was talking about where we can address the inequalities because the richest 10%, as you can see specifically in the vehicle purchase, we have like very high Gini coefficient. We have package holidays because of the flights which are carrying high level of inequality. So this paper gives us a very crucial insight as to which sectors are to be addressed. So um, now that we have a basic idea of both the papers, uh, we wanted to move ahead and uh, see, let's say, the broader uh, conceptual frameworks and criticisms that we found missing. So in the papers, we talk about, let's say, final, final energy footprints across income classes for 86 countries, which includes both industrialized as well as developing countries. Uh, but the important point that we miss is that we do not take into account the very reality of developing countries, that most of them have a colonial legacy and a major link, hence remains missing, because how does that factor into the reparative justice? This could further be conceptualized by uh, the equation that uh, uh, that Julia mentioned that there is energy use plus provisioning systems and then the integra in, and then the interaction factor and the provisioning system is dependent upon both physical as well as social uh, factors and that directly links into this. So just to set the more more context, if you see like the historical cumulative, um, if you see the historical cumulative. If you basically see the historical cumulative um, CO2 emissions across the countries, then you find that um, you see like countries like India across here. But uh, what we do is we would like to move to the next chart. Just one second. Yes. So if we see this chart, what this chart does is that if it basically shows the exact opposite chart, but like it allocates all the responsibility of the past emissions to the colonial rulers. And then you see, if you see EU and UK, they are like right, like leading right next to US in this case. And of course, like the true share of responsibility would somewhere be uh, like in between that like it would either be between the two extremes where emissions are either fully assigned to the colonial powers or let's say right now to the colonies. So within this backdrop, like what we want to do is that there is a need for a decolonial lens fundamentally to actually highlight that even the income inequalities which exist within countries are actually a result of modern, are not just like a result of modern economics, but are deeply tied to historical processes of colonization, exploitation, and resource extraction. And just to see this, we Just to see this, uh, since you mentioned in your paper as well, you mentioned how South Africa is one of the highly unequal societies. And because of that, the energy inequalities also tend to be higher. Uh, the thing uh, which is very interesting uh, is that within South Africa, this history is linked with colonial ties where there was massive dependence on fossil fuels since the British era. And as a result, colonial, as a result coloniality is a barrier to climate action, which is also talked about by Van and Revenelt in their paper called uh, Coloniality as a Barrier to Climate Action. And this inequality further disproportionately affects poor working class uh, black individuals. Uh, moreover, you raised the very important point of high plateau, uh, that social returns on energy consumption are after a while marginal. And this is also further linked to the uh, anthropocentric reality that Number one, more is better, and at the same time, human are at the top of the hierarchy, which we can see in this graph here. And this is further related to the evidence uh, given by uh, given given by many um, 
scholars, including Francois Sarazin, in his seminar yesterday. So what, uh, as you rightly said, that like the society has to be structured with, let's say, basic human needs, and at the same time, uh, it has to have a more eudaimonic uh, conception of well-being. But at the same time, those conceptions were very much present in indigenous cultures from a very long time, and they have been systematically erased. And when we do not acknowledge uh, the existence of those realities, uh, it would be nice and helpful to give credit where it is due, especially when they have been suffered, they have been suffering from systematic erasure. And given this, um, there is a need to develop a climate coloniality because uh, there is an unbearing heaviness of uh, climate change when uh, in the words of Sultana in 2022 and at the same time many of the solutions that we have right now are talking about let's say uh, retrofitting uh, the buildings and like electrification of like the transport system the bigger question is where are the resources that are needed for them coming from all these critical minerals are actually very much rooted in the global south so are they going to be extracted again from the global south like just to give you some example from survival of the greenest drc is the biggest producer of cobalt rwanda is the largest exporter of tantalum and then uh, latin america has massive resources of lithium so where are these resources coming from at the same time, because of this, if we are talking about redistribution, it doesn't just have to be within country, but it has to be intra-country and has to take into account the climate coloniality. And just to end things um, with a quote that, for the master's tool, we'll never dismantle the master's house. So we need to move beyond, let's say, the current conceptions of how we structure the climate policy debates and actually develop a new epistemology of how Justice should be done. Um, another, another wish list, uh, I would say not a criticism, but a wish list from Professor Steinberger's work, because we expect you to do build on this, is uh, a, feminist ecologist, a feminist ecologist perspective in the energy e inequalities. Of course, you need a man to be talking about this. But uh, yes, we need more men in feminist ecology, yes. So because, uh, see, there are some missing links in the developing countries context because the low female labor force participation rate and the nature of work that many women do or are forced to do because of their uh, societal characteristics also impact their energy consumption and as a result I'm not sure if the DLS the decent living standard survey factors in the consumption patterns of women specifically because I did not see a poverty line or a line of reference which tells us how far are these developing countries especially women versus men because these are aggregates of uh, the consumption expenditures and footprints so I'm not sure if uh, we are trying to achieve a basic minimum energy where women are still deprived so uh, I, I would want to see something on uh, ecologist perspective like if if women were supposed to be equal because there was a paper by professor deshpande in india and we did it um, if women had a similar type of job like men and they were uh, having a similar female labor force participation rate then india's gdp would increase by at least 30 percent so does that increase in energy consumption also uh, is factored in the 149 gigajoules per annum that we are aiming by 2050, uh, the basic minimum energy need. And um, yeah, and some, there, there have been studies, literature on uh, why energy consumption is also gendered. The most uh, prominent or prolific speaker or writer or economist on this one is Professor Seseleski. Uh, uh, who says that neither private or public energy infrastructure provision are gender neutral. Women use energy and electricity uh, differently than men because of their different household and productive activities. And there is also recent literature which exhibits that uh, the feminine use of, uh, the use of energy by women is different. For example, in India, more than half of the country's women do not even step out once a day uh, because they don't go out, right? So loitering is not loitering is also gendered. So where, where does that come into the energy footprints of women and how do we uh, put equality there? And like for example, these are all the examples that we saw in the paper. And for at least for the developing countries, uh, there are some countries who are participating in the DHS, the Demographic Health uh, Indicator Survey. And the consumption there is gendered. So they tell us how much women are consuming. And if you look at the countrywide uh, consumption expenditure survey, they also give us the amounts. I'm not sure gendered, but we can extrapolate the data and findings. There is scope for 
uh, putting gender equality in energy consumption is what I wanted to say. Yeah, so I'll briefly come back to what we were saying about this model just before. So this is a model that is um, bottom up, looking at comp compilation of um, expenditure. And what we found in the paper is there was a bit of a disconnect between the models that is was very bottom up and very forward and very progressive and um, really radical and some of the solutions that appeared quite top down and higher call. Uh, for us, talking about taxation and electrifying trains, bus, bicycles, and committing to electric and hydrogen ones, um, which are a lot of solutions that are only going through institution and are very top down. And we, we will talk about it in the questions, but we were wondering why there was um, a disconnect between the approach and the solutions. Um, because like we said, if the politicians don't want to listen, if we only propose top down, uh, solutions, how are we going to get there if they don't want to listen and it's only going to go through the institution. So we wanted to discuss about more bottom-up approaches to get these radical transformations that we were talking about, especially like my colleague mentioned, electrifying everything um, requires a lot of extraction and green colonialism from the global south and also requires a lot of electricity efficiency that we can see with the Jevons paradox could be a spike in energy use. So that's things we wanted to discuss and like we can see in the recent elections there has been a rise of populism in a lot of the countries around us and that contributes to the political context that brings us to the questions that we have now we have a lot um, as you can see but we'll focus on the three first women and we'll open the debate to everyone so like I said taking into account the political context including the rise of populism in Europe and the United States do you think such progressive top-down policies are possible and what alternative if not? And you want to put this in? And uh, given the background of, of the colonial uh, climate coloniality that I mentioned, uh, we wanted to ask that how do we actually meet the energy requirements globally while at the same time transition away from fossil fuels without aggravating green colonialism and unequal exchanges which are already happening? My question is the same. Uh, what happens w to the basic minimum energy uh, for well-being when you factor in equality between the consumption of men and women or when women start consuming and working in energy intensive sectors like men do? And we have one more question, right? So we we uh, can yeah. talk about it. I think yeah. these are our questions and thank you uh, for your attention. so much. You can check our Très bon, merci. Uh, okay, now I didn't see where you're sitting. Hi. Um, so uh, that was amazing. Uh, thanks for that. That was really, really impressive. So uh, I and, and uh, you actually possibly might have achieved the contrary of what you wanted because instead of feeling like I can do more work, I feel like I can retire happily because, uh, <laughs> as we as we say in French, la relève est là. Uh, so that was really impressive. Thank you so much. That was that was just amazing. Um, I don't have answers to, I have some answers, um, that, that, that's not completely true. Uh, I have some answers and no answers to quite a few of these points. Um, I think that the, the, maybe I can just touch on some of, the, some of the points you mentioned. So within the real project, we're looking a lot more at um, not necessarily green colonialism, but the, 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 the patterns of colonialism in um, unequal exchange and what would be what is what would be possible in terms of delinking, so what possible what policies or what directions would be possible um, for for degrowth post growth to be pursued in global south as well as in global north countries, um, and so we're doing uh, a lot of that work is happening in Jason Hickel's group in Barcelona. Uh, some of the first I think the first paper 
or the first couple of papers have already been published, including one by Morena uh, Hanber uh, Hanbury Lemos, so on labor. And uh, I also have a um, PhD student in my group who's looking specifically at labor footprinting. So right now we're still sort of in this sort of data gathering, like what does the picture look like? And that's part of the problem here is that um, you've heard of low-hanging fruit. I try to describe the research we're doing as fruit that's been lying around rotting on the ground for decades, like because it's just nobody has cared to look at it. But for instance, labor footprinting done in a proper way has not been done. Uh, so just trying to understand, and there's a gender aspect to that too, but the, um, the, the question of who's doing work for what and how much work is involved in the things we consume and the in a, inequality in that is something that um, we still don't, we, we just don't have enough, we don't have the, the pattern, we don't know enough about it yet in order to be able to say things like policies or to run models and scenarios. So that's one, some of the work that we're starting to do and some of the results will hopefully be published within, well some, some things are already published like Marina's paper which is beautiful and will be published soon. So we're doing some, some of that work, possibly not, uh, but not necessarily in the green colonialism direction, we're just sort of trying to understand what's, what's, currently, work, what's currently happening. Um, okay, in terms of, uh, there was another thing I wanted to talk about. So our model was bottom up because we wanted an accounting that starts from people and households. However, as we, as we saw, a lot of the policies that enable people to live well at low energy have to do with things like public services, public infrastructures, shared infrastructures. So for those, you kind of need to make those happen, right? So you kind of need a public transit system. You kind of need somebody to be taking care of roads and sewage and electricity networks and so on. Like th those are things that generally the state or the collective does. This is not something that um, a single individual or a single household can do, right? So I think that that's probably where a lot of the disconnect comes from. Uh, However, one of the things we're looking at within the project is we're looking at, uh, and that I'm interested in specifically, is this concept of economic democracy, which is basically where we try to, um, right now, the, this is sort of a caricature, but we have a political system that decides to stop, or that has been stopped, at the edge of the free market, because the free market is supposed to make optimal decisions for everybody else, which is a big, giant, planetary scale pile of horse shit. Uh, the market does not make good decisions for us. The market makes good decisions for billionaires because they're the ones running the market. So the question is, how do we interfere in the economic sphere politically from a democratic perspective? What are the kinds of structures that we need to put in place in order to have democratic decision making uh, that allows egalitarian distribution, that allows investment in the stuff that people really care about? And uh, so for instance, that means that if we have economic democracy, it's not just electing representatives, it's that part of our life and jobs and just our normal civic role, part of our uh, role within society is that we have to be making decisions in the economy. Like, you know, some of you would be part of your local water board or your public transportation board or the energy board or housing or whatever. Deciding how you want the bus routes in your community to go or where you want the parks to be and how you want the children's playgrounds to be organized and. Uh, how are we going to deal with energy and how are we going to, so that these are the, th and, and, and the same with all industries, right? So that we have to start m managing and making these decisions ourselves, which requires a whole bunch of things to happen, which will probably not happen. Um, but I think that, because again, you need policies that favor those kinds of organizations and institutions. And that also brings us into the domain of mutual aid is how do we make, how do we give ourselves the capacity to to create infra structures and in institutions that allow us to make good decisions for ourselves collectively, which is something that's very much lacking. And it's lacking even at a state level. So everybody always criticizes the Soviet Union for central state planning. But the reality is that every single economy in the world did industrial policy up until the 1970s. We had people whose job it was to think about industrial policy, which industry, which technology, which what should we invest in. That capacity is gone. Nobody knows how to do it anymore. Like the people whose job it was, like there were people who, from trade unions, from ministries to trade unions, there were people who were trained in doing industrial policy. 
in thinking about industrial planning. That just does not exist anymore. And that's something that we need to sort of learn again because the market is not doing it right. So uh, that's maybe, that was the end of my rant, I think, on in economic democracy. Um, gender stuff, absolutely. Um, definitely, we're taking this much more into account in, uh, the, in the determinants of well-being work that we're doing. Um, again, we can't do everything, so this is a big topic. If any of you want to take it on, start doing PhDs in this stuff, that would be great. Um, I think one of the things that we're up against is sometimes there's data issues. And you're right that there's a lot more data at the national level than at the international level where things tend to get aggregated. Um, but there's beautiful data. Like there is beautiful data in so many countries. Not in all countries, but so many countries. India has beautiful data, um, just fantastic. Uh, at the state level as well. Like it's just not being taken advantage of enough. Um, Marta Baltrushevitz, she did her PhD on four countries, the UK, which I showed you. Zambia, Nepal, and Vietnam, which had really super interesting results, but I didn't show you those results because we were going fast. Like Zambia, one of the poorest countries in the world, has some of the most beautiful household survey data I have seen in my life. And nobody is using it, right? So that's, that's one of the things that, um, that I think is really important is basically to take advantage of this. Now, we're not gonna be able to do all of it, but a lot of the gender stuff is going to be possible to do um, at the national level, possibly more than the international. And maybe I'll leave it there, and we can go to the general discussion. growth and consumption from Western countries, uh, bringing money in, help, helping to develop. Um, what sort of challenges do you think reducing consumption would have to development of other states in the world today, and how can we overcome those? I'm so glad you asked that question. Thank you, Charlie, from the UK. Um, so uh, it turns out that I have this genius PhD student, uh, Sergio um, Nag, Surya Deepto, uh, and he has looked at some of this stuff, and some of it is going to be published. Anyway, but the thing that's really interesting is economic crises in the global north that we have examples of, like um, very, various episodes of financial crisis that mostly hit consumption in the global north. One of the things we see is that they actually have very, um, either a dampened impact at least, like if they have either no impact or a much lower impact in the global south uh, or developing countries, because basically, when the global north is not appropriating resources from the global south, the global south is able to trade with each other and do work for each other. And so they, they tend not to see that very, very much. So I think that that's one of the things to, to, to realize is that one of the things that the global north is doing, like we give ourselves this image of being this benefactor, like our overconsumption is giving, we're job creators, you know? Our overconsumption is giving people jobs uh, in the global south and giving them money. But in fact, what we're doing, and we see this with the labor appropriation, the labor, appropri the labor footprinting stuff is honestly nuts. Like everybody, well, everybody in Europe in this, in this room, we're basically using one full other person to work for us full time in the global south. So that's just not okay. Uh, so what we're doing, if we reduce consumption in the global north, we're actually freeing up capacity for investment and local buildup in the global <coughs> south. Um, because the other thing we're doing is we're actually doing wealth appropriation through debt repayment. So if you actually look at net money transfers, there's some money that goes from the north to south through wages, through, through paying for, for, for goods. There's m some money um, that goes from north to south through aid, very little. And, uh, aid. and then there's way more money that goes from south to north through debt repayment. So we're actually basically taking work, taking money, taking resources. And if we stop doing that, then um, development maybe could happen, actually. So on, also autonomy, in terms of autonomous development on their own terms, yeah. Yes. Um, yes, yeah, thanks for the talk.
Uh, um, uh, so he's not published yet. Okay. Yeah. But I'll, I, yeah, soon. Every woman will know his name. He's fantastic. Anyway. Yes, uh, Friederike from Germany. Um, thanks for the talk and also thanks to the discussants. Um, I have a question coming back to this uh, energy use accounting that you did. So you said it's um, achievable, decent uh, living is achievable at 40% of current energy use. Is this en like the 40% of all energy use or all energy consumption? And like, what is the, because I was wondering about like production and energy from production. So right, if we say yeah. everyone should have a mobile phone, like who's producing the mobile phone? Yeah. Like what is the, the did yeah. you account for this? This is the yeah. first question. And then relating to this, because you were mentioning industrial policy, and I think this is a very interesting topic also for thinking about the more degrowthy ideas, which are often very utopian, mm -hmm. and then linking it to more maybe pragmatic discussions, if you mm -hmm. want to make this distinction. Um, about industrial policy right now and thinking how, yeah, this can be, this can be reconciled. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Federike. Um, so uh, the first question, so we took into account uh, energy footprints. So we're taking into everything is allocated to consumption, but we're taking into account production is the easiest way to say that. And we're looking at final energy because primary energy is a terrible indicator for reasons we can get into if you want. Um, um, or less interesting for the future, let's put it that way. Um, the industrial policy topic I think is super interesting and I really wish I'd included, um, there's a paper by, so I'm going to write down his name because we have chalk. Um, somebody called Jarmo Kikstra, if you look him up, he wrote a paper, um, I really should have included this one. So this is not part. This is part of his PhD, not part of my project. Uh, he co-wrote this paper with Narasimha Rao on decent living standards um, and estimating the energy use for that as well. But he went like several steps further than what we did, um, and he looked at the investment necessary in energy terms, not in money terms. But basically, you're building up infrastructure, you're building up technology. How much energy is necessary for the buildup of that infrastructure and technology? and what sectors and what geographical areas does it need to happen in. And that already gives you a sense of like, if you were doing industrial policy for human well-being, that would be the first paper that you would read because you have this sense of like, where do we need investment? And long story short, we need investment in the housing sector. That, like we need massive investment in the housing sector for building, for building safe housing for people. Like there's a lot of housing that needs to be built, especially in the global south and for retrofitting, making it much more energy efficient. Um, there's also investment in the mobility sector. And, and the amazing thing about the housing sector is if we do that investment, there's a huge amount of investment to be done, but it's very capital intensive, and then you benefit from having very low energy consumption for the rest of time. So that's one of the things that's interesting with that, with that direction. You also need industrial policy in mobility to build up public transportation systems, for instance. Um, and when we were talking about the Jevons paradox and uh, rebound effects, one of the things I'm sh I should say is that when you were looking at energy sufficiency and focusing on human need satisfaction, we're basically prioritizing certain types of use in a way that the current economy does not. So the current econ economic system just takes efficiency and turns it back into the capitalist machine of inequality and expansion. Um, this is definitely a much more interventionist uh, system that does not do that. So we're basically not letting Jevin do his job. Um, yeah. Thanks. Um, Romain from France. <coughs> uh, thanks again for the presentation. Um, I was wondering because like uh, earlier in the presentation, you mentioned the socioeconomic factors enabling well-being. Yeah. And I was wondering like um, how each uh, of these factors actually contributes to well-being. I, I think it depends. I mean, I assume it depends on the um, zones of the world. Like, uh, I mean, maybe in Europe, we um, consider more important the public services for public well for well-being. And I guess in uh, the global south, maybe uh, electricity and sanitation access must be more important. But how do they each contribute to okay. well-being? Okay, um, I'd have to go back to the to the paper to the analysis to try to understand that. I mean, you could you could sort of see. I don't think of 
we could probably figure out which, which areas or at least which income categories were most affected by which factors, but these are global results. They're sort of general. Um, and one of the things um, that's really interesting, um, and this goes back to Marta Baltrushevitz, Marta Baltrushevitz's papers on Zambia, Nepal, and Vietnam, is that she actually looked at well-being outcomes, and she also looked at things that you could find in household surveys along the lines of access. I mean, we, you don't find all the same indicators. I mean, it's a problem with the national stuff is like it's not always completely comparable, but access to things, you know, so still things like uh, access to public services, access to infrastructure, and found that those were very important um, as well. So, I mean, it was extraordinary. There, there are some households in Vietnam, like Vietnam is a super poor country with very high inequality, and um, there are some households that have be well below average energy use that have good uh, well-being outcomes. And what they tend to have in common is they tend to have high levels of education, high levels of uh, electrification, definitely, and then um, access to public services, access to markets. You know, there's a health facility close by. So basically, you, you see the fact that people are at low consumption levels, individual consumption levels are protected by the infrastructure around them. Yeah. Can we open, sorry, can we open the window? Because I, I can feel the oxygen level sort of like, I'm already in the CO2 up here. Thanks. Dina from Pakistan. Um, I have a question. So you mentioned that we should be um, investing in carbon efficient or energy efficient housing and stuff. However, um, some of the research we did last year for one of our courses, oh, for, uh, you mentioned that we need to yeah. invest in energy efficient housing and like low carbon and quality and all. Yeah. So for some of the research we did last semester for one of our courses, one of the issues was that um, when it comes to housing, um, I think there was a case study on the UK that um, there's a lot of bureaucratic work. So even if you're, say for example, you're selling solar panels, uh, but to install them, there's a lot of brown sludge in them or brown infrastructure. So in the end, people don't end up opting for the scheme to install the solar panels because you know there are way too many steps in between. So mm -hmm. it takes up a lot of time, a lot of effort, and no one really has that much time and effort. So these are programs by the government, but they don't really work because of steps in the government, so how do you suggest you know, yeah. you tackle that or, you know? So, um, I, so I, 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 am, I am British. I lived in the UK for 10 years and I was naturalized. Um, uh, my husband is British. I'm just saying this because I don't, I don't have an ax to grind against the British that much. But, oh my God, what a terrible place. Okay, so, <laughs> like, things are done so, like, the, the neoliberal brain worm has been active in that country. You know, they're, they're almost like, well, I guess Chile is, Chile is the real canary in the coal mine, but then after that, the UK followed pretty closely. Um, so, um, so, yes, all the programs, so, the thing is that the, the neoliberal brain worm means that the UK government and policymakers think that individual preferences should drive the market. So rather than, um, which of course is completely not true. So rather than facilitating a default good option and investing in that for everybody, what they do is they, um, what they do is they uh, um, uh, put the, bo put the uh, burden on individual households to go through all this work because it's their preferences. And so that's an ideological choice that the government is making. You could make the policies completely different. You could, for instance, say every new building that is built must have this, just do it. And you don't have to go through paperwork for that. It's just a building regulation requirement. We do that for everything. We do that for electricity standards, for water standards, mm -hmm. for material standards, housing, with flooring. You know, we do it for everything. Why not do it for energy efficiency and renewable energy production? And in fact, there was a plan to do that, <coughs> even in the UK. But the building industry, the builders, lobby, squashed it because they didn't want to pay up front to have costs go up up front that then the users benefit with lower costs later on. That's not interesting to them. Um, and there was a study that I could probably try to find again uh, because it was published in the media that estimated that the extra cost to an individual average house for having a heat pump put in and some solar panels um, was on the order of, and uh, you know, good insulation 
was on the order of a, something, it wasn't that much, it was something like five to 15,000 pounds. When you're talking about building a house, that's usually around several hundred thousand pounds, so not very much. The cost of putting it in after the house is built um, was uh, um, something like five times more. So basically, when the, when, the, when, the, when the industry is lobbying against facilitating these measures generally, they're really pushing extra costs into the future uh, in a way that's quite terrible. So yes, there's, there's different ways of doing policy, and that is a particularly terrible example. Thank you for bringing it up. Zulfia from Azerbaijan. Uh, there was a part of the uh, presentation that was mentioned that uh, reducing emissions, we can do it fast because we don't need extra technologies. It didn't sound me uh, very intuitive because like, uh, I, I was wondering, like, what do you mean by that? Like, we don't need extra technologies for reducing okay. emissions. I think, uh, yeah. yeah, okay. So that maybe we could hear and then we could hear the other parts. Hi, I'm Aurélien from France. Uh, it's like a political economy question. And basically, the idea is that if we want to avoid the negative consequences of climate change, we need massive institutional change. And in order to do this, we need that progressive forces bearing uh, an ecological pro uh, pr project take power, basically. And like, I'm gonna unroll a uh, small reasoning, but I think it's useful and I want to have your uh, uh, opinion on this because to me it seems pretty solid but basically the idea is that um, like we need a, a theoretical framework to understand how to take power basically uh, there are people who work on this namely uh, Stefano Amable and uh, no, Stefano Palombarini and Bruno Amable who are uh, regulation theory uh, researchers they're coming from there and they're also uh, they're also heavily re rely on Bourdieu's sociology and basically they say that political parties mediate the interest of social socioeconomic groups um, in order to create social blocks which they lean on in order to take power. Mm -hmm. So, and creating solid social blocks is absolutely necessary in order to back policies and create institutions. So the example would be the bourgeois bloc in France or in Italy. And um, my, uh, what I think is that Basically, the opposition of the dominant class, especially to ideas such as degrowth or uh, uh, a radical um, or radical changes in the global productive structures, uh, would be extremely high. And we can see, for example, uh, Kaleski's paper uh, the, on the political consequences of full employment, which talks about this, but not in the uh, not in relation with the subject of uh, climate change. And like if we take an example of political cha of institutional change, for example, social security in France in 1946, we can see that basically this was made possible because we had a communist labor minister, Ambroise Croiza, uh, which was backed by the communist social bloc, which was the dominant bloc at the time because of World War II. Like the 25% of the working population was at the CGT, so the dominant union at the time. The Communist Party was the first political party, and we ha we had armed communists roaming the streets because they had weapons because they were engaged in the resistance. And what we observed, what we observed at that time, is that there was tremendous opposition to the creation of social security, even coming from some portions of the state apparatus. And another example of social of institutional institutional change would be the Bretton Woods agreements, and we can see that they have been uh, created in the wake of World War II and that it was uh, a, a night, tremendous emission of political uh, passions, let's say. And what I want to say is that like, core countries are the most powerful, so they have the most potential to implement institutional change. However, <coughs> they are the less likely to do it, given the crumbling state of the progressive blocs uh, in these countries, and these progressive blocks have been destroyed by the last 40 years of neoliberalism. And periphery country might have these blocks in, in them, but they do not have the power to force core countries to change the course of their actions. So my conclusion would be that we do not have uh, powerful pro progressive social blocks, nor the time to build these blocks uh, that would allow us to push the institutional change that is needed. 
like we don't have armed communists roaming the streets. So uh, I, it might actually be already too late and we're all already doomed, especially if we consider the consequences of collapse of the AMOC and that it's already showing signs of weakening. And so my question is, uh, do you have an idea how to solve this problem? <laughs> <laughs> do you think it's uh, a legit problem or am I totally mistaken? Do you see an opening in this? Like, what's your <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, okay. Yeah. So I'll start. I'll start with uh, with Sophia. Um, uh, where are you? Yeah, hi. Um, so you're right. I think I think it's less new technology. It's not no new technology. So the, a low energy future does require some investment in technology and infrastructure. It's just a lot less. If you think of building up renewable energy capacity or low carbon energy capacity um, to satisfy 700, 800 exajoules of energy use globally per year, that's a lot more. That's massive compared to, you know, 150 to 200 exajoules. We're talking about a huge factor of change here. So low energy demand does require some energy uh, investment. It does require some resource investment, but it requires a lot less than swapping out, continuing on a growth, growth trajectory, uh, which is also an inequality trajectory, as we know, and, um, and swapping out all the fossil fuel infrastructure for uh, renewable or nuclear, swapping out all the diesel petrol cars for electric cars, like that is just mind boggling in terms of resource use and probably there's not enough resources and probably if they were exploited it would be like, I mean you're talking about major ecological disasters. Some resource use is necessary, some extraction is necessary, but you know if it's 10 or 100 times more that makes a big difference. Yeah. Um, I didn't catch your first name. Uh, Aurélien. Aurélien? Yeah. Um, uh, thanks Aurélien for your small question and no I don't have an answer. Uh, so. I could leave it at that, I guess. I think that, um, I think that we, it is useful to look at these past cases. I think it's, um, I, I, you know, yes, we don't, we're already, we have already lost a lot and we are losing a lot. And there are some tipping points, uh, you know, there, there's some irreversible changes are continuing. We're losing species every day, about 200, I think. Uh, you know, like th there are things that we are not going to get back. The question we are now, we're now in a world of harm reduction rather than uh, something else. So the, but everything we do <laughs> will in fact lead to harm reduction. So that means we don't like give up and collapse is not a moment, right? Collapse has already happened to some communities in Pakistan that were devastated by floods a few years ago. They already lived through that or didn't survive, right? So, 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 so we're seeing this, you know, I, th I, th I think that this idea that there's one collapse and then we're on the other side of things is very wrong. And it, we should be start thinking about our time as you know these devastation, being visib making visible the devastations that are already happening all around us, and recognizing them, and as opposed to waiting for the big one to hit us. Um, I think that that's one thing, um, which is not very cheerful, but still. And I think that in this idea of harm reduction, we should also be building these structures of mutual aid. And one of the things that was really interesting with COVID is that the communities that were able to deal with COVID and organize themselves really fast and get groceries to old people and keep people alive and protect themselves and get masks to people and so on, were people with strong social bonds. Like where you had good you know, neighborhood organizations, people knew each other, they, they could go ring on doorbells, they knew each other's phone numbers, um, and they could organize things quickly. And you don't need communists if you have that, or communists would be part of that, I guess. So what we need to be doing is we need to be building these social structures. And this is something that we see in, uh, I dabbled for a while, long story. I was in, um, involved in uh, looking at the role, how people protect themselves against uh, disasters <coughs> like hurricanes, right? Now Cuba has, gets run over by hurricanes. It's like right in the hi hurricane highway all the time. It has a very, very low mortality rate. The same hurricane that hit New Orleans, Katrina, um, went through Cuba. The mortality, I think, killed five people. Why was it a mass death event in New Orleans? It's because those social structures of mutual aid don't exist. Now, in Cuba, they have communists who have minivans 
They go around the neighborhood. They have a list of all the pregnant women, everybody with a broken leg, all the people who are too old to get out on their own, et cetera. They pick them all up. They bring them to a safe space. Everybody knows where to go. It's all very like organized. And in the US, they were like, oh, shit, evacuate. And if you don't have a card, die. Oh, and by the way, if you're black, you'll be shot, right? So, which, is, which, which happened, right? Like law enforcement shot black people trying to get out. So, and vigilantes. So, uh, so, so the, the thing is, like, I think that we can, we can do a lot to protect each other with social systems. And what matters is these systems of mutual aid, local organizations that basic, where you basically kind of know who's there and who you can build on together. The other thing to understand is that in times of revolution, which can happen fast, um, people tend to come together. They come together in the squares, they come together in councils, they come together to try to set up democratic decision making, and they can do it really well, and we can learn from those examples and try to uh, make sure that they happen quickly and, and well and don't get immediately squashed um, when, the, you know, when these times of sort of upheaval come, that, that we give people capacity to make these decisions for themselves. Uh, within communal structures, but that's not a very, it's not a full answer, that's for sure. Yeah, hello, I'm Lucien um, uh, from France or the UK, depending on the mood. Um, uh, my question was regarding uh, the topic of green coloniality and your response regarding embodied labor. Um, as far as I understand, the theory of uh, ecologically unequal exchange um, or at least Hornborg, who's like the, the forefather of it, has shifted towards a concept of technomass, um, which is supposed to represent the appropriation of embodied um, materials, energy, labor, etc., and then its fixation in um, uh, uh, productive uh, technology, basically, uh, infrastructure. And to me, it's in this accumulation and fixation phase that um, colonialism and imperialism can be explored rather than looking purely at embodied labor uh, and equal exchange. Um, and I wonder, well, first of all, what your thoughts are on that and um, the, the difficulties that studying these colonial, post-colonial and neo-colonial dynamics uh, poses when a lot of the data is sort of accumulated from the 16th century to today. Hello, my name is Matilda. I'm from Germany. My question related to the paper, um, and there were some sectors I didn't see. They might have been in other, so if that's the case, um, we can answer the question quickly, which was on the one hand some cultural sectors, but also a kind of bigger question, which wasn't addressed, like military and security, where basically if that was an active decision to say it's not necessary, I would be interested to hear if there were any discussions about that. Thanks. I think there's... Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and mine might be quick. I'm Haley from the U.S. You kind of alluded to the response to my question, I think, in your last comment, but it was going to be because for me, kind of the literature around degrowth really often fails to recognize the increasing reality of you know crisis and economic shock for you know the vast majority of the world outside of Central Europe. And so my question was going to be. Do you think that there's space for studying involuntary degrowth within the broader lens of um, post-growth, and if so, how? And maybe, I guess, just to build on that, in addition to kind of mutual aid systems, as you mentioned, if you see others. Okay. Uh, let me just comment on that. Uh, yeah. uh, you are talking about the real, which is a project, a ERC grant project, and we are working almost with the same people in Barcelona with Epoch Doctoral Network, and there is one of the PhD working exactly on that topic with Giacomo D'Alisa and, uh, and Simone D'Alessandro in Pisa. So, and at the last week of uh, January, they will all be gathered in Paris, so you might be able to meet some of the PhD students. Uh, okay. Please. Yeah, that was the basically the so may, maybe I'll just start with uh, with Haley. So within the real project and especially within uh, Yorgos Kalis's group, there is a whole bunch of people look at looking at real existing degrowth. So basically looking at cases of either in some voluntary involuntary degrowth, but basically existing cases of degrowth and what measures different communities, you know, at the level of a city or at the level of uh, an <laughs> island or. Uh, a country in some cases have taken in order to protect their population and to do things differently. And that uh, sometimes involves things like uh, the kind of mutual aid. So it's basically learning from real cases. So people are doing that research, absolutely. And uh, as, as David said, that there, there are, there, there's quite a bit of that going on. Um, 
uh, Matilda on the sectors. So um, you're correct that we did not, okay. So the, we're using input output and within input output you have household expenditure which is represented by part of final demand. Uh, you basically have three parts of final demand. You have household expenditure, you have um, capital investment, uh, which is sort of build up of industry and stuff, and you have government spending. And because we were interested in household inequality, so inequality across income classes, we focused on this household level. So you're exactly right, it does not include either capital investment, and it also does not include government, because the thing is we didn't know how we would then distribute them across income classes. Like you could make up a rule, but it would kind of be fake. So that's why we were, that's, that was our focus, was looking at that inequality of expenditure um, and uh, so that's why we didn't look at, at, those, at those aspects. There are people who are studying uh, the environmental impact of uh, military spending. So, I mean, you probably know that the U.S. military is the largest single industri industrial actor, whatever, in terms of emissions. And they obviously have geopolitical interests to do with that themselves. Um, but that's not what we look like. However, we do have people starting to look at the geopolitics of degrowth. Um, and trying to understand, you know, from an international relations perspective, from geopolitical theory perspective, what would the implications be? Uh, but I don't really have answers there. It's more like we're asking the questions, we're looking at it. Okay. And uh, Lucien and uh, the concept of green, co so green coloniality and the concept of technomass. So I agree that these concepts are really important. Um, I guess from my perspective, I'm always somebody who wants to know what the numbers are. And until we know like lab what labor, you know, because we know energy embodiment, we know uh, material, you know, we, we have material footprints, energy footprints. We don't have the labor footprints yet. So it's just like, okay, can, let's measure some of that stuff. And then when we, when we bring the different aspects together, we might get a better perspective on what's going on, especially because we have sectoral disaggregation as well. So we can see which sectors are doing which. There might be some sectors that are very, that are doing a lot of labor, extraction and there are some sectors that might be doing a lot of material extraction they might not be the same right so that's one of the I, I just think anyway so I, I think this is super important stuff to be doing we're doing part of it which I think is useful because otherwise we don't even know yeah yeah thanks a lot I'm Juan Castillo from Mexico and I was left thinking from your presentation from the importance to take a political stand uh, errors like from the um, scientific debates that there are and later on to taken from analysis to rebellion the science and scientists for advocacy and activism and I was left wondering what will be if there will be any limits for science and scientists when politicizing their activities and if the scientific objectivity will be somehow compromised by it great question uh, okay do we have another question or or while it's traveling, maybe I should take advantage of time, yeah? Um, or go ahead, go ahead. Right there. Uh, I'm uh, Talal from Egypt. I'm sorry? Uh, I'm Talal from Egypt. Egypt, and exactly. what's your name? Uh, Talal. Okay. Right. My question was, how would green transition and degrowth get implemented in global south countries? And would such countries afford degrowth given the current economic development status that they're having? And another related question to that is that how we can actually implement green transition within the global south without falling in green colonialism? Because I remember one time when COP27 was hosted in Egypt and uh, there was panel for Google about transportation, all of that to be uh, dependent on renewable energy. And they were openly talking about uh, Rwanda, that yes, the transportation system isn't working like that, so how are we gonna fix that? Okay, we're gonna go to Rwanda and gonna try to implement a uh, transportation system that's kinda dependent on renewable energy resources. So yeah. that was part of my question. All right, thank you. So uh, thanks, Juan. I think this is really um, a really uh, interesting question, and I'll use the chalk, I guess, over here. Um, I'll use a better piece of chalk. OK, so if you Google UNIL, and um, I'll write it in French, because I know that that will work, recherche et engagement. OK. Um, because uh, I, we had colleagues who basically, um, we had a bunch of colleagues who went and joined Scientist Rebellion and even founded um, the Doctor Rebellion in Switzerland. 
and got arrested and caused a lot of publicity problems for the university. And then the university got attacked. And then they basically were like, we need a working group on research and engagement. And one of the things that they did that was really, and they wrote a report, which you will find here. And it's translated into English. And it's excellent. Um, so I really recommend that if you're interested in these questions, you go and have a look. Because first of all, what they did is they said, it's not just activism, it's engagement. It's like when research and researchers go and engage in society. Um, so I've been on TV a couple of times. Every single time, do you know, want to know who I met? Colleagues from the economics department. They're on TV every day. Nobody ever criticizes them for their activism when they're advocating for neoliberal policies and ever more uh, growth and extractivism. That's not a problem for them. When I go on and I say we need less of that stuff, that's then I'm, an, I'm the activist, right? So engagement um, is every is you know that's all just like let's already start treating engagement across the board the same way. Um, the second thing that this report did is it basically said one of the things that we're asked to do is be neutral. Like there's this idea of scientific neutrality, and uh, this report um, argues very I think very convincingly that neutrality is not the right concept. Uh, because science is always done in a political context, even like the choices of funding that we receive are political. Like in the US, physics that I did for my PhD was funded by the military. Uh, I was even on a Navy scholarship for a year, but my supervisors didn't tell me because they thought I would object. Ethics. All right. Uh, so, so, uh, so, so, but you were absolutely right to mention objectivity. And the question is, you ask a research question, and then you try to answer it. And the gold standard is reproducibility. So it's like, are your methods clear? Is your data clear? Are you, are you basically going through the scientific process of where somebody uh, else asking the same research question, using the same kind of data, the same kind of methods, would actually come to the same conclusion? And that's where we get objectivity from. So we get objectivity from peer review. You know, the, the, the standards of our profession are what guarantee objectivity. The fact that we have a political position or that we are advocating for certain political directions do not mean that we can't do objective research. Because ob objectivity comes from the methods and the standards of our profession. So I think, and I think that that's really spelled out quite nicely here. So I would just recommend having a look at that. Um, and it's really nice to be able to argue on those grounds because they do such a beautiful job and they cite all the right things. And it just makes it very um, easy to argue in that direction. Um, um, from, for, for your question about the, uh, when degrowth in the global south, so that's one of the things that we're trying, you know, looking at more and more because there are more and more global south researchers interested in this, and the question of green transitions, reproducing green coloniality within the global south, I think is really important. Um, and we're also seeing really, it's not like when we look, for instance, at the labor footprinting, we see different trade patterns than when we look at material footprinting or energy footprinting. Um, so we see like the periphery being exploited by the semi-periphery in different ways. So things get complicated, which they should, and we should pay attention to that. Um, I think um, I had, I had one, one element of answer here, which I think is, um, is useful, but now I've forgotten it. I think it probably had to do with, uh, with this idea of public services. So when we think about degrowth in the global south, we're talking about um, societies that are not necessarily export oriented. They're not um, wealth accumulation for an elite oriented. So the question is, you know, so the question is, what, what are you doing for who? And as long as we can ask that question, I think that uh, degrowth in the global south looks, in a lot of cases, like growth because it has to correspond to growth. Because, uh, for instance, if you look at Yarmo's Kickstra paper, Kickstra's paper, you see how much investment is necessary, uh, and also at Narasimha Rao's research, how much investment is necessary for the billions who are in uh, material deprivation. And they need investment. And so then the question is what, is, what does that correspond to? How do we supply it? Does it need to be supplied through green colonialism? I would argue no. However, uh, I think one of the things to really watch out for, and this is particularly the case for Africa, um, is that the fossil fuel industry is going bonkers uh, trying to convince African countries that have yet to invest in energy infrastructure that they need to go with fossil fuels. And this is something that is far, far too little studied. And I'm just going to give you two examples here. Um, one is, and this is the World Bank and the IMF, 
uh, so they run investment programs, right? You can get money from the World Bank or from the IMF to do investment, let's say, in energy infrastructure. Good, great, that's great. Um, if an African country wants to invest in renewable photovoltaic electricity, which, if you just look at the technical standards, is the cheapest form of electricity that mankind has, or humankind has ever made anywhere on Earth. That's how performant the, uh, like, the technology is super cheap, it performs super well, it's just like, it's the cheapest kilowatt hour on Earth, and the conditions are super good in Africa, right? It should be super cheap, but if you take a loan from the IMF and the World Bank, it's way more expensive than coal, which Africa does not have. It is cheaper to get money from the IMF and the World Bank for a coal-fired power plant because they have artificially decided that a coal-fired power plant or a fossil fuel, gas, or whatever, is a proven technology and hence low risk as opposed to photovoltaic, which is new and risky. So they give higher interest rates, they impose higher interest rates artificially on renewable technologies for Africa. And this is something that we should be paying a lot more attention to because it's basically stopping a green transition in Africa and it's making African countries artificially dependent on terrible technologies that they don't have natural resources for. So the whole, the whole thing is just sort of like, it's like a, um, a, a wedding cake of, of, of awful and stupid. Um, the other thing is uh, there's a YouTuber that I like a lot called Climate Town. I don't know if you know him. He has the best mustache in the business after Timothée Parikh. Um, uh, so uh, Climate Town, he has an episode on the, the lobbying of the fossil fuel industry in Africa. And it is massive. They are, they are pulling out all the stops in terms of trying to get uh, African countries to really be dependent on the fossil fuel industry, including car infrastructure, so building highways, like putting tons of money into highways as opposed to train systems, et cetera. So they're, they're really just trying to, to create dependency on their products right now while they still can. And it should be a much bigger scandal. Hi, I'm Chitnan from India. And um, I had a question about uh, lobbying exactly. So, um, uh, excellent presentation, excellent discussions. Um, you talked about, like the discussions pointed out that you proposed like bottom up problems, but top down solutions. And you answered that, well, we cannot have um, like one person planning the whole uh, housing for their own, um, for their own family, and so we need uh, like top-down solutions. But then you talked about lobbying, which is the big problem. And so we, you just talked uh, in your presentation as well about the car pentagon and the lobbying being so strong to destroy the entire public transport system. And Global South specifically has very strong lobbies, where like one man essentially becomes too big to fail, uh, especially in the case of India being the Adani group. And uh, then how are you supposed to tackle such lobbies? So are you suggesting to have green lobbies or how do you uh, think about the idea of um, environmental democracy coming in play with uh, this lobbying system? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. Okay. Yeah. What struck me when I was reading your paper about the disabling uh, standards um, is minimum energy is that mobility sector seems to be the more one of the most energy intensive sector. I'm sorry, and which one? The mobility yeah. sector. And the most unequal, especially if you look at air transportation, where the top person mobilized as in 75% of it, you're saying. So um, you calculated that mobility, mobility energy requirement um, should be of 5,000 to 15,000 kilometer of mobility per person per year, which I looked up is like um, between one to three flights from Paris to Montreal a year. Um, and so, as we know, it's like a very unequal sector. And recently, uh, Jean-Marc Jancovici, which is a very famous um, French engineer and energy transition specialist, sparked a lot of debate because he said people should only be allowed, allowed four flights uh, in their life. Um, so I was wondering, because it's a huge disparity in between his calculation and your calculation that would allow a lot more aviation, 
and um, overall about this whole sector of aviation. I wanted to know what kind of policy uh, or changes in general would you want to see implemented in the aviation sector, and what do you think of these days? Okay, last one here. I'm Jan from Germany. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I have a a question related to the to the little f uh, philosophical part that you had with the the different conceptions of needs and uh, uh, well-being because I think it's it's a very uh, important uh, discussion and uh, your conclusion uh, with the um, yeah let's say that the more ob objective needs is, a, is I think a very radical conclusion that also goes against a lot of uh, what is uh, c current welfare economics that uh, focus only on like individual utility and preference? But what you argue in the paper is that you that, that there's some uh, decent uh, li living standards that are somehow uh, universal. Um, I, I think the the criticism that will come often like from the from the liberal <laughs> is uh, like how can you like who has the power to decide what is uh, necessary, like what is what is the need, uh, and because it, it will be very hard as well to to uh, convince people on the street saying uh, you can only have 15 square meters uh, that you can heat, for example, and uh, so w who who has the power to to decide that? Is it is it science? Is it uh, um, the demos, the democracy? Uh, and also, how can you have like governance uh, institutions that make this um, more ac acceptable for the just the, the general public? That there's no resistance of the, the scientists want to constrain our freedom. Okay. Wow. Okay. Um, again, very small questions. Uh, thank you all. Um, so the lobbying and Adani. I think that that's one of the. Th so thanks for that. Um, so that's a huge, it's a huge problem. And I think that a lot more of our research focus needs to be pointed at that. And a lot of more of our communication needs to be on that. So a lot of the theory of change of climate scientists was, hey, science is real and climate catastrophe is real. Now the rest of you go change everything without paying attention to the political realities and the, the power plays there. And that was extremely foolish and it wasted a lot of decades. They were wrong. So I think that we need to be researching, uh, researching this. Um, I've been paying a lot of attention to the Atlas Network recently, uh, which is sort of this network of 500, more than 500 neoliberal think tanks. They will also be active in India. They will also be doing Adani's work. Um, so I think that this is something that we need to actually do our job of researching and exposing, because the more we do that, the harder it becomes for them to, to do it. So they fear sunlight, and we have to be part of that sunlight. So I think that that's already, uh, that's, that's already one of the things that we can do. Obviously, they also control parts of the media, so our life becomes difficult there. But you know, that, that's, that's one of the things, is at least pay attention to it, research it, take it seriously, um, and expose it. You know, And work with NGOs who are working on exposing it, work with activists as well. So I think that that's really important. Um, OK, the, the 15 to 5,000 kilo person kilometers per year, that's total. That's every time you leave your door. So that includes all transportation. So that's not just flying for in our model. Um, and what we said in the model is that we were taking into account one flight per person every two years. Now, because we're looking at energy only, that's actually not, in terms of energy, if we go to, towards decent living standards, the energy burden there is not huge. The problem is um, if you try to translate it to carbon emissions, because uh, flying has no substitutes, it, you do get into trouble. However, this is a much lower level of aviation than currently, and it's much lower than where it's going to. Because, and aviation is one of the most unequal sectors. So if you already get rid of frequent flying, basically 20, it's roughly, it's around, roughly 20, 80 roll. I might be a bit off, but not that much. 20% uh, of people take 80% of flights. So if you already stop them from taking 80% of flights and you bring them back to, the, lo to the, the normal level, you've already gotten rid of a huge part of your problem. So I think that part of it is making the flight allowance more equal. Uh, there are a huge number of people who just never fly in their life because they don't need to, don't want to, or whatever. Um, and so, uh, so I think that it's not like it's not no flying, but definitely a lower intensity of flying, and especially getting rid of frequent flyers uh, would be really important there. So I think there is alignment with uh, Jean Covici. Um, and then the question is, you know, because you're going to have to come up with aviation fuel, where does that fuel come from? 
uh, the aviation sector is trying to get lots of biofuels, that's a disaster, right? So um, for sure, that should not, yeah, they're, they're, they're terrible. Okay, and on the philosophy side, uh, I think it's really interesting in terms of who decides. So first of all, um, the work of Leah Tamberg, which I haven't showed you yet, uh, because it's not published yet, um, basically unifies the two. So she shows that uh, subjective well-being is actually the product of need satisfaction. And you can show this very robustly using econometric data. So it's true, kind of. Uh, but does that mean that people feel that it's true or realize that it's true? You know, the, then there's, 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 a whole, there's a whole perception aspect. I think um, it's not a question of necessity. So a lot of the human needs theories, including um, ones from the great Manfred Max Neef, who was a Chilean uh, ecological economist, he had these participatory workshops around his human needs theory that was called human scale development, which is actually directly to counter the World Bank and its top-down perspective. And these workshops were basically getting people to decide how they wanted, how their current human needs were not well satisfied and how they would want to satisfy them. And that was really interesting. And I think that we see similar things coming up from things like citizen assemblies right now. Uh, there's also a research community around uh, the um, sustainable consumption corridors, which is basically uh, in Switzerland and Germany and other places uh, go, doing participatory processes to decide where people think it's reasonable to go. And we can do this through democratic deliberation. Um, so I think that these things are, um, it's not just top down or bottom up, it's, it's, it's also a collective decision making process. Um, and, that, and there are people who are starting to work in that direction, which is quite interesting. Thanks so much.